here's a day to look forward to. Then with the ransom around God's throne, we'll praise our Redeemer and King. We'll tell how His mercy for sin did atone through countless ages this song will sing and it was all because of God's amazing grace because on Calvary's mountain he took my place and someday some glorious morning I shall see him face to face all because of God's amazing grace. And someday, some glorious morning, I shall see Him face to face, all because of God's amazing grace. Amen. Thank you, honey bun. I appreciate you playing for me this morning. Ephesians chapter 4 in your Bibles please. Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus. Ephesians chapter number 4 and we'll begin reading this morning in uh, verse number 25. Ephesians chapter number 4 and verse number 25. I had the privilege of teaching Troy's class this morning in his absence, and uh, we didn't get near done with the lesson, and I'm hoping if I can sweet talk Troy into letting me teach again next Sunday, maybe I can get it finished up, amen? Uh, but we, we began a lesson this morning on this evil day called Halloween, and today is the 31st day of October. I'm not going to preach on that this morning, uh, though I am going to uh, mention some things from the Word of God uh, that we need to do as we live our day-to-day -day lives uh, to be more like Christ and to honor and glorify Him. But this day, the world celebrates Halloween. Brother Keith this morning, Brother Keith Huey in our Sunday school hour, when we were taking prayer requests, Keith said, I want us to pray for these churches that recognize Halloween. And uh, he made mention that he saw some church signs this week, uh, announcements on the church signs of not just any churches, but he said independent Baptist churches who were canceling their service tonight in order to have their Halloween celebrations. That's sad, isn't it? And I think that the reason that perhaps churches do that is because they don't understand where it came from. And they don't understand how evil and wicked it is. And that it isn't just some day for kids. It'll suck the adults in too. And uh, it's not just something that uh, started a long, long time ago as a fairy tale. I give you full assurance on the authority of the Word of God that witches and sorcerers, ghosts, and all those sorts of things are mentioned throughout the Scriptures. And they're just as real as they can be. And they're just as evil and wicked as they can be. And they're, they receive all of their power from Satan himself. It was interesting to note in my studies that in the United States of America, our founding fathers, Refused country until the early 1900s. And look at it today. Now once was what was forbidden as evil and wicked as is much a part of our culture as 4th of July. And they say, oh, it's just fun and games for the kids. No, that's about as far away from it as it can be. It began by the ancient Druids, that pagan bunch, in England and in France who worshipped 
the day of the dead. And they make human and animal sacrifices uh, on this day of the dead. And uh, you say, well, that's got a wicked beginning, but you know, that stuff don't go on today. I beg your pardon. Has anyone ever heard of Wicca? Have you heard, you ever heard that word Wicca? You may not know what it is, but have you ever heard it? That's modern day witchcraft. And Wicca takes their practices from the ancient Druid practices of what we call today Halloween. It's just as evil and as wicked as it can be. And there is verse after verse after verse of scriptures throughout your King James Bible that speaks about these witches and ghosts and all these evil things that has to do with what we call Halloween. But for the purpose of the message this morning, I want us to look at uh, the book of Ephesians chapter number 4, and I'm going to begin reading in verse number 25. Paul says, Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor. For we are members one of another. Be ye angry, and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corruption, corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Today, I want to bring a message this morning using Ephesians 4 and verse number 27 as our text neither give place to the devil. Our Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you, Lord, for your marvelous grace, your amazing grace uh, that caused us to go from being your enemy to being part of your family. It's your grace that saved us through our faith in Jesus Christ, in his finished work upon the cross of Calvary, giving his life, paying the wages of sin, which is death, shedding His blood as an atonement for our sin. And that blood today we know, Father, is fresh as it was the day that Jesus placed it upon the mercy seat in heaven. is still there today, forgiving our, every one of our sins. Now this morning, our Heavenly Father, we ask that as we bring the message today, that each of us will listen closely to the words of the Apostle given to him by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And help us to understand that Paul is trying his very best to encourage the church at Ephesus as well as to us today, that we should never in our Christian life give place to the devil. Now all of us may look at that verse in verse 27, neither give place to the devil as a given. Oh, we would never, we would never give place to the devil in our life. But Lord, when we look at the scriptures in this context around this verse, I think we'll find that all of us from time to time have been guilty. And there may be some today that are currently guilty of giving place, giving a entrance, giving a foothold to the devil in our life. And so may, may we learn from the scriptures today how to avoid that at all cost, that our lives may not give place to the devil, but may our lives be the temple of the Holy Spirit. And may our lives glorify God in our body and in our spirit, which are God's. Save that one that's with us today that's nearest hell. This may be their last opportunity to ever hear how to be born again. 
I pray they're not rejected. Lord, I pray that each of us will search our hearts. And if we've been given place to the devil, Lord, may we find a place to repent and confess and give the place to the devil no more. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Would you be uh, amazed or surprised? Or would you be angry with me if I made the following statement? If the devil's in this service today, one of us brought him in here. Because he does not have an open invitation to come into the house of God. He has no place in here. There's no purpose for him to be here. And if he's here this morning, he came because one of us gave him place in our life. And he rode with us and he came through the door with us this morning. The Apostle Paul tells us in verse number 27 that we should neither give place to the devil. We all give, uh, invite people into our life. But we should be careful who we invite into our life. We should be careful of our circle of friends. The Bible says in Proverbs eleven fourteen, 14, uh, where there is no counsel, uh, there's problems, there's trouble. Uh, but in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. So we should, need, we should always be careful who we open our circle of friendship to. I think that that, along with the word love, the word friend and the word love are Two terms that are pretty use, uh, loosely used in our day and time to express an emotion or a relationship that really doesn't exist. It takes a while to get to know someone before you declare them as your friend and certainly before you express the highest of all emotions in our life, love. We should be careful who we say that to. We don't want the devil in our life. Amen? Amen. We don't want to give him a place in our life, but we do. Jesus warned us in John chapter 10 and verse number 10 that the thief cometh not, and the thief is the devil. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. Is that someone that you want in your life? Someone who's going to steal from you? You wouldn't put that person in your circle of friends. Someone who threatens your life. Someone that you fear is going to physically kill you and harm you and kill you. You wouldn't allow that person into your circle of friends. But the thief cometh not but for to kill. And you wouldn't invite someone into your circle of friends that you know going in is going to steal from you. You can't turn your back on them. You have to keep your eye on them all the time. Or they'll steal from you just blatantly steal from you. Kathy told me Wednesday night that two of our moms are missing. Somebody just drove up out front of the house of God and just helped themselves to two moms. Now they're not tied down. They're not locked down or anything like that. But just to drive up on the parking lot of the house of God. Somebody went by my wife's car the other day. We don't know where. We don't know who. And just help themselves to the valve stem covers. Just help themselves. Well, I don't want to go buy any. They look pretty nice. We'll just take them. That's not somebody you want in your circle of friends, is it? But Jesus said the devil comes to steal and to kill. Why would we want him in our life? Why would we want him to have anything to do in our life? <laughs> and Jesus said that the thief cometh not only to steal and to kill, but he comes to destroy well, I, I'm not going to choose somebody in my circle of friends that has the intention of destroying me or my family. I, that's not going to be part of my circle of friends. And yet, Jesus said that the thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. And how many times have we given him place in our life? Paul said, give, neither give place to the devil. Simon Peter, the most vocal and the most... Uh, 
outspoken, if you will, of all the apostles. He gave place to the devil. Did you know that? And Jesus called him out on it. In the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 16, beginning in verse number 21, the Bible says, From that time forth began Jesus to show his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him. Now, when's the last time you rebuked the Lord? Now, I'm, not going, I'm not planning on rebuking the Lord. Amen? But Peter rebuked the Lord in verse 22. And he said, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. Now Simon Peter thought he was doing right. Simon Peter thought he was doing good. I'm going to protect you, Lord. Far be it from you. Nobody's going to come take you. Nobody's going to uh, uh, kill you or condemn you. You know what Peter was doing in his zeal? He was opening the door and the devil slipped in. And in verse number 23, Jesus turned to Peter and said, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou art an offense unto me. For thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Did you notice that, Simon, that Jesus didn't address Simon Peter? He addressed the devil. Because Simon Peter had given him a place. In uh, the Gospel of John, chapter number 8, Jesus was talking to the Jews there, and He said to them in chapter 8 and verse 44, ye are, of your, ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there's no truth in him. When you speak a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he's a liar and the father of it. And Jesus said, and because I tell you the truth, ye believe me not. And so we see the devil slips in, of course, to lost people, but he slips in to save people as well. Now the Bible tells us over in 2 Corinthians chapter number 2 and verse number 11, Paul is speaking to the church at Corinth and he's talking about being careful how we live our lives lest Satan should get an advantage of us. For we are not ignorant of his devices. Now I want to talk to you for a few minutes here about neither give place to the devil. And what I want to bring out is what the Apostle Paul tells us in this context of Scripture that I read, beginning in verse 25 down through verse 32, of the things that we can do in our life that'll give the devil a place. It'll be the same thing as us opening the door to him and saying, come on in. Help yourself. Make yourself right at home. You say, preacher, I would never do that. You would say, preacher, I've never done that. Well, let's look at what the Word of God says and we shall see. Now, before I start this, I want to go back and look at verse number 24 for just a second. And we see a command of God through the Apostle Paul. He says in verse 24, And that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. So the first question that I ask of all of you today is, have you put on the new man? In saying that, I'm asking you, have you been saved? Have you been born again? Do you know that you've been saved and born again? This means yes. This means no. Have you put on the new man? That is of the utmost importance that you put on the new man. Because if you are not saved, if you have not put on the new man, you don't have to worry about the devil getting you. The devil already has you. Because John chapter 3 reminds us that he that believeth on him hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not on him is condemned already. You are not condemned if you've believed on Christ, but if you have not believed on Christ, you're condemned already. So make sure that the new man has put on, that you have put on the new man. But because 
you have put on the new man does not mean that you don't have to deal with the devil anymore. You still have to deal with him. As a matter of fact, he turns the heat up after we've been born again. And the closer that we live to the Lord and the closer we try to live to him and live by his word, the hotter he's going to make his temptations towards us. So Paul says, neither give place to the devil. Now begin in verse number 25. We're going to look at these things that Paul said that we need to be aware of or we may give place to the devil. Verse 25, are you with me? Hope you still have your Bible open. In verse 25, Paul said, Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Now he's obviously speaking of the body of Christ, that we are all in one body, the body of Christ. We are one body, the body of Christ. And how did we get that way? By putting on the new man, by realizing that we were sinners condemned unto God and headed to hell at the time of our death, and the Holy Spirit of God convicted you of your sin, showed you that you were lost without Christ, and when we came unto him and put our faith and trust in him, we were saved by the grace of God and we put on the new man. Hallelujah. But he says that as a new man, first of all, if we don't speak truth, we're giving the devil a place in our life. Lying. And not just out and out lying, but twisting the truth. Taking what is true and speaking the truth but twisting it in a way that makes someone think something else, that's the same thing as lying. Stretching the truth, embellishing the truth, telling little white lies. Does anybody know where that ever came from? Who originated that little phrase? Who ever came up with the idea that God overlooks little white lies? And why are they white? Sin is red, amen? Sin's not white, sin's not black, sin is red. You say, how do you know that? Read Isaiah 118. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be like scarlet, what color is scarlet? Red. They shall be as wool. Though they be red like crimson, or they shall be as wool, they shall be as white as snow. Forgive me for misquoting the word of God. But the fact of the matter is, is that we don't tell little white lies. Every lie we tell is a red lie. And it's a lie in the sight of God. And you see, it doesn't just hurt us when we don't tell the truth, or we stretch the truth, or we're deceptive with the truth. You see, how we handle the truth affects others as well. Now we know that the Bible speaks at great length against lying. But Paul particularly warns us here in this passage of Scripture, neither give place to the devil. But he says when we don't speak truth, we're giving a place to the devil. We're opening up ourselves and affecting not only us, but those around us with lies and lying never works. You can never, you know, you, ever, you, you remember the old um, advertising campaign years ago for Lay's potato chips? You remember their slogan, you can't eat just one. Well, when it comes to lying, you can't just tell one lie and get by with it because you're gonna to have to tell another lie to cover that lie and then another lie to cover those two lies and eventually it's going to overtake you. And the devil will see to that because when you tell the first one, you're opening the door to that one, that thief, who has come to steal, kill, and destroy. You're letting him, you're saying to him, just come right on in. Now I bet you when the temptation to lie has come in your life, you never sat down and thought about it quite that way. But you know something, when it comes to living the Christian life, here's a really good rule of thumb. 
Everywhere you go, everything you do, everything you say, everything you think, everything that has to do with your day-to-day life, consider this. Would I go there? Would I say that? Would I do that? If Jesus Christ was standing beside me in person, If Jesus told the Father, excuse me just a moment, I'm going down, back down to earth, to earth and I'm going to spend a little time with my bride. And Jesus came and stood beside you in a physical manifested body. How differently would you live your life? But you see, it is exactly that real. Because the Holy Spirit literally lives on the inside of us. If we're saved, the Spirit of God is living down in here. And when we tell the lie, we're telling it in the very presence of God. And we can't hide from it. And worse than offending the Holy Spirit, worse than grieving the Holy Spirit, worse than quenching the Holy Spirit, We have walked to the front door of our life and opened it up and said, Hello, Satan, come on in and make yourself at home. You would never admit that. But according to the Word of God, that's what lying does. It gives place to the devil. Look at verse 26. Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down Upon your wrath. Number two, uncontrolled anger will give the devil a place in your life. And that includes holding grudges and refusing to forgive. The Bible tells us that we will get angry. And there are times that we need to get angry. We need to be angry against sin. We need to be angry against evil. We need to be angry against unrighteousness. But my friend, we must be careful how we show our anger. Did you know... That the things that you criticize the most in other people are usually the things that you're doing yourself. We have to be very careful that our anger and our criticism doesn't make us to become what we hate and what we criticize. That's why... We criticize it so hard is because we're guilty of it ourselves. When he talks about our wrath, our anger, he didn't say that we won't do it, but he says, when we're angry, be ye angry and sin not. Anger against evil, anger against sin, anger against unrighteousness. That's not sin. That's righteous anger. There are things we're supposed to be angry at. Jude said in his little epistle that we are to hate even the garment spotted by the flesh. Sin should be hateful to us. Sin should be intolerable to us. You say, preacher, have you lost your mind? No, I'm trying to preach the Bible. But he says, but that anger that we get built up inside of us, that anger should not go on day after day after day. The anger that we deal with should be resolved before the sun goes down that day. We should not hold grudges against one another. There's not a person in this auditorium that don't mess up and make mistakes. 
and do things that are absolutely boneheaded and stupid. I ain't asking you to raise your hand. I'll take it. Because I have done enough boneheaded and stupid things in my life to help all of us. Amen. And most of them I do with this. You know why you're laughing? You're guilty as I am. Control that anger. It's all right to have righteous anger against that which is wrong, that which is against the Word of God. When somebody takes our Lord's name in vain, that ought to anger us. Amen. The Bible tells us not to carry our anger over from day to day. We should work to get it settled now. And uncontrolled anger can be like a sore on your body. It starts out just minute. I, I, let me give you a quick illustration of, of that. A friend of mine and I were cutting a tree one day, and uh, we worked out there all day long, sweating, working in the wood. Now, a couple of days before that, I had been helping a boy roof a house. And uh, I threw a pack of shingles up on my shoulder and started up the ladder, and I didn't get a good toehold on one of the rungs. And my foot slipped down to the rung below, and when it did, uh, you know, them ridges there, them treads on them aluminum ladders, uh, it... it, it Scratched my leg through my, through my blue jeans. Well, I, when I, after I carried it up there, come back down, I thought, well, how bad did I cut myself? Well, I, uh, I looked, and I, first I couldn't even see anything. I said, well, I didn't even break the skin. And then I started to see a little trickle of blood. A little old place wasn't big as a head of a pen. I said, well, okay, that's nothing. So I went on back to work, and I gave that little sore no attention. Didn't pay a bit of attention to it. Went on to work the next day, and then the next day I'm helping my friend. We're cutting a tree. We got it all done, got it all cut up, all loaded up, all hauled away, brush all drug off. And as I was coming in to the house, my right leg was hurting to beat the band. I thought, what have I done to my leg? Now the, the nick was on my shin, about middle ways between my knee and my ankle. Now, and the more I walked just from the back of the yard to the house, by the time I got to the house, I couldn't hardly walk. And so I had on brogans and a pair of tube socks, you know, and I pulled that thing off. And I looked, and, and from my knee down to my ankle, you'd have thought I had a regulation size NFL football on the shin of my leg. And there was just one little spot that I had nicked, and man, that thing was red and was hot. I mean, it was like his sunburned hot. And Lisa said, well, you're going to the doctor. So I got over to the doctor, and the doctor took one look at that. And he says, you want to keep your leg? I said, yes, sir, I do. He says, you, then you're going to do everything I tell you to do. And I've never had this happen, but that one time, he brought in a, he brought in a syringe full of this green goop. It looked like lotion. And so help me, that syringe had a needle that long on it. <laughs> and he said, sit still and don't move. And he stuck that needle down into that little hole. And he shot that syringe of that green goop in my leg and then gave me a course of antibiotics. He said, don't you miss taking even one of them. And you might be able to keep your leg. Now, could I have prevented that from happening? Probably, if I'd have went in. Put a little peroxide on it, cleaned it up, got it cleaned up. You know, put a little, uh, little whatever you call that, antibiotic stuff on there. Maybe put a Band-Aid on it. Maybe took care of it, but I just ignored it. I didn't take care of it. And that thing festered up, and I got a doctor telling me, do you want to keep your leg? Now, my friend, that's what anger, uncontrolled anger will do to you in your life. You think that's nothing, and it's no big deal. And before you know it, it's about got you ruined. We need to attend to it quickly. Now, I'm taking way too long with these points, and so let me finish up the message here. So we need to, we need to speak truth. Speaking, if we don't speak truth, we open up the door to the devil. If we don't control anger, we open up the door to the devil. In verse 28, he says, Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, 
that he may have to give to him that needeth. Number three, dishonesty in our work gives a place to the devil. Dishonesty in our work. You know what? Have you ever, don't raise your hand. Lord, help you, don't raise your hand. But have you ever had a person that you liked and you wanted to be a friend of theirs, but, but a person that you didn't like also liked that person? And all of a sudden there's competition for the affections of that person. And you're going to go over and above what you would normally do to win the affection of that person so that you'll be your buddy instead of their buddy. Did you know that you just stole? You stole their affections. That's stealing. You go to work and you're given 30 minutes for lunch break and you take 45. You've stolen. You walk out of work, you walk out of the plant, walk out of the factory, walk out of the office. Pens and pencils and sticky notes and legal pads and all that. They'll never miss it. You just stole. And the Bible says, let him that steals, steal no more. And when we walk out with those things and when we steal affections of other people, when we, when we uh, uh, steal the trust of other people for our personal gain, there's a lot of ways to steal. Taking something that doesn't belong to us. Why, we were taught that as children. Amen. I remember that. I remember being taught that lesson. You know, you don't take something, you don't touch something that don't belong to you. But when we do those things, we think, oh, nobody ever thinks anything about that. They'll go right ahead, but you just open the door and say, hey, Satan, come on in. Have a place in my life. Dishonesty in our work. Let him that steals steal no more. You know, I'm not going to have time to finish all this. I may save the rest of it for another time because if you, if you saw how many points I had, you'd say, preacher, just let her go and we'll pick it up another time. But I'll give them to you and you can write them down and maybe we'll preach them later. Number four is letting corrupt communication come out of your mouth. Verse 29, grieving the Holy Spirit. Verse 30, refusing to let the wrongs done to us, to let them go, to refuse to let them go, gives place to the devil. Verse 31, and in verse 32, refusing to be kind gives a place to the devil. Seven things that Paul teaches us in these verses of Scripture that are not only sinful and detrimental to us but it opens the door in our life into our letting into our circle of friends and confidants Satan by these behaviors let's bow our heads and close our eyes and we'll ask our musician and song leader to come and get a number of invitation ready I hope you read this text again and think about what we've preached this morning and maybe we can finish the message another time. But the fact of the matter is, is when we look in these scriptures, we're given things that open the door for Satan in our life. And you, you testified out of your own mouth this morning by the shaking of your heads and, and the amens that you don't want somebody in your life that's going to steal from you that's going to try to destroy you and try to kill you. But yet, we let the devil do that. Our Father, in Jesus' name, as we pray together, I pray this morning that if there's someone here among us in this congregation that has never surrendered their life to Christ for salvation, I pray that they would do that this morning. I pray that you give them the faith and the courage to step out and come and to receive Christ. There'll be someone here to pray with them and help them. They'll find no judgment here at this altar. They'll only find grace and mercy. And I pray they'll come and be saved today. And then I pray, dear Lord, that you've talked and touched the hearts of the children of God today. 
And though we didn't get very much covered, Lord, I pray that we preached what you wanted us to preach. But there are so many things that we can do that will give a, an open place to Satan in our life. And I, I pray that we'll look to you for our strength to not do that, to not be guilty of that. And of course, we open the altars to one and all, whatever the need is in each one's heart and life. We pray that they'll find that need met in Jesus Christ this morning, that they'll step out publicly and come unashamed to the altar to talk with you, Lord. It's their business with you, not with anybody else. And so I pray that hearts will be touched and lives will be changed today by your grace and mercy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.